Hello, Michael Kirby, thank you so much for making the time to uh, have a little chat to us today about your insights into the impact of technology on society. Yes, I apologise that I can't be at the conference, but I'm uh, doing a, a long arranged uh, appointment and they would have skinned me if I had not turned up. Right, well, look, notwithstanding that, and, and I know you have been both a keynote speaker and a guest at the previous gala dinners that we ran as the Internet Industry Association, as we then were. And, uh, in and it was a very male-dominated industry. I hope things have improved a little bit. I'm looking around <laughs> in the industry to see whether the gender balance has changed a bit. It was even worse than the legal profession in my early days. Well, you actually made the point on the night when you addressed us in 2008 and in the four parables of internet regulation that you had kindly uh, written for us and is still available on YouTube and on the High Court website as the transcript. I hope the High Court justices are looking at it too. <laughs> but the legal profession is not that far behind the technology profession, but I have to say that um, there are very positive moves within the technology sector to encourage more women to take on the, the roles within cyber, cyber security in particular. Yes, it probably has to start earlier than the industry. It has to start in schooling right. and in recognition that women and men can be equal uh, if they've given the equal opportunity in mathematics, science and other relevant uh, training. Right. And I think, I mean, we could sort of foray into uh, the neuro neurological differences between men and women, but there is something that women definitely bring to a problem, to a situation. They sure do. They, they will talk about it. They will talk with each other. They will network about it. They were the original networkers long before the mobile phone came along because they often carry the burdens of the world in families and uh, mm. breakdown and problems, and they will talk about it. It's a salutary place to start, but I, I wanted to move sideways, as it were, into... Um, the event itself, that we're celebrating 30 years of the internet in Australia this year. And uh, I mean, it's a it's an amazing thing to live through a revolution as we have. It is. And it's astonishing. See. And it just goes to show the thing we've got to ask ourselves uh, is what are the other revolutions that are just around the corner that we haven't foreseen but mm. are going to hit us uh, during our remaining lifetimes? And in fact, there is quite an active discussion at the moment around artificial intelligence and, um, uh, you know, machine intelligence overtaking human intelligence. Yes, a number of deans, including the, the new dean, executive dean at Q Queensland University of Technology, Dan Hunter, who is dean of law at uh, Swinburne University, he says it is now bordering on professional negligence for a law dean not to be engage with the issue of artificial intelligence and not to be talking with his students and uh, informing them and making sure they are aware of the likely big impact of artificial intelligence on the law and on the delivery of legal services and on the future of the legal firm. Mm. And I guess generalising that observation to the effect on society, we can't even begin to imagine the disruption that AI will cause. I mean, there's no, undoubtedly going to be very positive um, outcomes from AI. In, well, in I, I will see it tomorrow when I go to a, um, a trip to the United States. I will go through the um, immigration counter leaving Australia, no more um, agents uh, scrutinising me, looking at my photo and looking mm -hmm. at me. The, mm -hmm. the whole process for 99% of people going away from Australia is performed by scanning and artificial intelligence. And you just hope that the algorithm has you in there correctly. Uh, I remember, do you remember the film, there was a film called Brazil that was produced by the guys that did Monty Python and it was a dystopian future where uh, a simple error, a computing error, had misidentified an innocent person as being an enemy of the state. And it's a very, it's a black comedy, but it really does highlight, uh, you know, the, the conflict that we face in society where decisions affecting our own liberties and, and rights as humans 
That, become... that is true, but I don't think we should be pessimistic on the whole about artificial intelligence. On the whole, I think it's going, like the internet, to be a tremendous advantage to humankind, and we've got to use our human intelligence and our human sensibility to make sure that uh, we end up in control of it and that it is our servant and doesn't become our master. Right. It's not coincidental that in my work on uh, human rights in North Korea, one of the early surprises I got was that Kim Jong-un has banned the access to the internet for the people of North Korea. The only people who have access to the internet are the elite, mm. uh, the people who are the reliable classes that work uh, for the dictatorship in North Korea. So. Uh, you have to sort of think what Stalin uh, or other tyrants would have made of the internet, but um, also the great advantages in a free society of giving uh, people everywhere access to information. Mm. For example, when I was a young lawyer, it was very difficult to get up-to-date <clears throat> legal material about cases or even statutes which were part of the law of the land. Mm. Now, thanks substantially to a great initiative of um, lawyer legal academics at the University of New South Wales and uh, uh, University of Technology Sydney, Graham Greenleaf, mm -hmm. um, uh, Professor Mowbray and Professor Chung, uh, people everywhere in Australia, not just lawyers but citizens, can get access to the latest cases, the latest statutes, and this has spread right around the common law world. Mm -hmm. India uses the technology which was developed in Australia. The, right. the biggest common law country and uh, parliamentary democracy in the world oh, wow. uses our technological advancement. Mm. It's a great step forward for liberty of access to the law. That's interesting you should say that. I, as you're saying it, I'm remembering back my days at law school at the University of Tasmania, which though the fourth or third oldest law school in Australia had a very under-resourced law library, but what they did have through the ingenuity and initiative of uh, one of the computer guys there was a Mac lab, a, a room full of computers that were uh, well connected to the internet. And I remember a lot of my legal studies were actually utilising resources that we could get online. It's still a very fine law school and it still has uh, people who are real experts and probably that Mac lab contributed to the ideas uh, of uh, the internet and the law um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, in fact the University of Tasmania has the only law review which is the Journal of Law and Information Science and I happen to be the chair of the uh, oh. advisory board. Well that's funny I'll because you a subscription. I was on the editorial board of that magazine oh, yes. when I was studying well, there. You left it in a perfect state so <laughs> we are now uh, working in, in your shadow. Yeah, I did write an article, I think it was about internet uh, regulation actually, in 96 that would have been. So, and actually I remember building a website for the university that was uh, the Australian Intellectual Property Law Locus, we called it. And my lecturers had permitted me to develop a website instead of writing an assignment, uh, which I thought was very brave of them. And uh, we went on to create a legal resource that was relying on Graham Greenleaf's work at Ostley. And we had actually referenced a lot of the cases through his work. It's interesting you mention that because in the last week or so, uh, uh, there have been articles in the newspapers protesting at the imposition on legal academics advancing in the law of having to have a PhD, which was the old rule for getting evenness in promotions mm -hmm. and advancement and uh, legal research. But nowadays, people may have other ways of uh, developing their minds and developing their knowledge and including knowledge of a wider world than Tasmania, Australia. Right. You've gone on to look to a wider world and so have I um, from my law school days in Sydney. It's, it's so different today and it's at the fingertips of every person. They're all there on the Bondi Junction train at 4.55 in the morning when <laughs> I get the first train to work they're all there looking at their mobile phone and into the internet they plunge. Into another reality which is um, somewhat disconnected and I think this is one of the challenges that I wanted to um, uh, briefly raise with you is how as society do you feel that we're adapting 
to technology where uh, you have this compulsive urge to remain uh, apprised of what's happening on the internet, but at the same time you're still functioning within a physical environment. Do you think there's a tension there? Or? Oh, well, obviously there's a tension, and uh, that tension hasn't yet been fully resolved. Uh, it's a bit like those early days when, uh, in the Australian Law Reform Commission, when I was the chair of working with the Australian Computer Society, mm. we began the steps that led to the Privacy Act. Mm. Uh, and we began that, those steps by reference to the uh, OECD guidelines on privacy, uh, 78 mm. to 80, which remarkably enough are still accepted by the international community as the mm. basic requirements of fair dealing in respect of privacy. But one of our principles was that information that is collected, uh, personal information uh, relating to an individual data subject, mm. collected for a particular purpose can never thereafter be used for another purpose mm. without the authority of law or the consent of the data subject. And that was a good principle in 1978, 80. Right. But come along with um, Google and search engines, and now we insist on being able to use earlier data for um, personal and non-personal use. Mm. And this uh, therefore shows that it's often very hard to regulate because the technology changes and therefore the basis on which the regulation is framed, good for its time, uh, is overtaken by the advancements in the technology. And that is even more so today. That is so, and, and I remember uh, when Lawrence Lessig came out to Australia, and we've talked about this before, yes. and he'd written that book, uh, Code as Law. Yes. And it was a very um, advanced... I referred to that book in a case in the High Court. Uh, I think, I think that might have been the <coughs> first reference to Lawrence's work. And he was an amazing and very forward-looking guru. He, he was, and I was child. very captivated by, by this idea <coughs> that was, I think, very novel for its time, that, uh, that the technology embodies value judgments and, and moral and ethical, I suppose, positions in respect of uh, uh, individuals. That's right. Now, uh, I think there's a very good illustration of that. That is the Marbo case. Mm. Uh, in the Marbo case, the challenge brought by Mr. Marbo was to 150 years of settled land law in Australia. Mm. And uh, I could have gone away into a corner and written the reasons why you should not recognise Aboriginal title, or at least the judges shouldn't do it, it should mm. be done by Parliament. But uh, the High Court of Australia, looking to international principles of human rights, uh, especially the principle that you cannot deprive people of fundamental rights by reference to their race, mm. which is what we did in Australia for mm. the first uh, 170 years of our, our existence. Mm. and. Uh, they said that can no longer be the law. So it required a lurch, a change, made by human beings, made by reference to grand principles of universal human rights. And, and how you could program that into a system and how you could make sure that there is always that leeway for change uh, to adjust to fundamental principles of justice and human rights that really is the challenge that the new technology presents to us. Otherwise, we will clone like, just keep reproducing old laws, even though society's values and uh, uh, culture have, have changed. And I remember as we were taught in law school that the power of the common law is its capacity to adapt to changes in society. Yes, I'm not sure all my colleagues <laughs> agreed with that. But, you uh, were considered <laughs> the, the great dissenter and the, uh, a judicial activist by some, but but I mean, uh, that, that's the nature of our, our system, isn't it? That we, we uh, and, there, and of course there are parliaments as well to amend oh, yes, laws. No, well, the most law in Australia and most uh, democratic countries are made by parliament, but uh, we do need that uh, leeway for choice and change, which Professor Stone taught me at law school, and I never forgot his lessons. Mm. When Chief Justice Mason, after Marbo, he sat in Marbo, I didn't, it was decided before my time on the High Court, when he was asked where, where do these rights to 
adapt the law come from? And he just mm -hmm. looked at the law books behind him and he said, where do you think the common law came from? It right. came from multiple decisions, millions of decisions in particular cases, mm -hmm. adapting and reproducing uh, in a in an adapted way mm -hmm. to the justice of new circumstances. And I guess that's the point. And I guess it's inherent or implicit in what Lessig was saying that unlike the law that we know uh, through the historical precedents that, that it creates, uh, the, really to reiterate the point really that what you do when you codify law or values into technology is you freeze them in time. And so you've lost the capability to adapt. And I suppose that's essentially the warning, isn't it? That um, as we devolve more of our um, humanity, as it were, into technology. It is, it's the warning, but whilst we're getting somber and thinking about the warnings, <clears throat> we've got to think of the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And if you ask what is the big problem in the law in Australia, I would say the big problem is that it is a very expensive profession because its personnel have all been very thoroughly and lengthily trained. Um, and therefore, it costs so much money that many people can't get to law and can't get to justice. There's been an estimate that about 80% at least of legal problems never get off the launch pad because mm. people just can't afford it, mm. including judges and, and other relatively wealthy people. Mm. So the hope is that um, with artificial intelligence, this is something Professor Dan Hunter teaches, with it will come ways of delivering many solutions to people of modest means. And mm. if that gives them access to the law and to uh, elementary justice, then that is a good thing, an undoubted good thing, because mm. at the moment they're just left twiddling their thumbs and denouncing the law and lawyers, whereas right. uh, in the future there will be ways of bringing community justice, first of all citizens to the law books, mm -hmm. as can happen now, mm. but there will be ways of simple mediation and uh, decision making, um, at least at the first level of decision making. There may be need to be access, and there may need to be access in order to sure, be sure that in the end you can get to that human sense of justice that is a special feature of our legal system mm. uh, when you ultimately get to the High Court, uncorrupted judges with powers to adapt and change, but how many people can get there? It's not accessible, is it? And I remember a Law Reform Commission report, I think it was called uh, Access Denied or something of that nature, and they were talking about the delays, that uh, justice delayed is justice denied. Yes, well, it's not only delayed, justice delayed, justice denied was what was stated in Magna Carta in right. 1215. But mm. the problem now is that you have a system which, if you can work it, is a very just system. You will get ultimately, overwhelmingly, to just and reasoned and explained outcomes. Mm -hmm. But if you can't get into the door, if, if it's just too expensive. In the old days, the work of lawyers was often cross-subsidised by land title conveyancing. Mm -hmm. But then when anti-monopoly law came in, that really was removed from the cross-subsidising capacity and so um, getting people to pro bono legal assistance is only a very temporary holding pattern. Right. We need something better. There's a more and fundamental problem. You're it suggesting. is and hopefully AI is going to help mm. to solve it but then we've got to find other things that lawyers don't do now that they can do that will be socially useful mm. and worthy of the expense mm. and to the extent that we can't we've got to keep the lawyers and other people occupied and this is going to be the challenge in the future. Government finding ways to deal with people who used to do routine jobs but in a world in which the routine jobs are simply disappearing. Taken over by machines and automation and I think you were almost heading in that direction with your previous comments. I was thinking a judicial algorithm sort of where we were slightly moving on this point of uh, automating at least the preliminary stages of, uh, 
of justice. Is that what you were sort of moving towards? Yes, uh, but we, we were <clears throat> at that stage, even in my time uh, as a judge in the, in the Court of Appeal, we had a case where a man sued for damage to his penis. Uh, and uh, the judge, uh, it didn't affect his reproductive capacity, but it affected the appearance and so on. And he sued for damages. And one of my colleagues said, well, fortunately, he was not a woman and therefore appearances didn't really matter. And, and this was a very male <laughs> attitude. Right. And many men, uh, uh, straight or gay, would think it's very important. Matter, but, <laughs> but it was a, a way in which um, um, the internal algorithm was programmed to... Right cultural norms mm. and the stereotypical prejudices. And uh, so human beings are not necessarily the best judges of justice. Right. Uh, but machines don't have a will to do justice. Right. So somewhere between those two uh, points of the spectrum is where we stand. And what we have to do is make sure that any algorithms for delivery of law uh, can adapt to the justice of the particular case ultimately. That's a fascinating analysis and I think an invitation, I suppose, for our legal and technology innovators to try and explore these issues in, in more depth around this, what is our ultimate objective and I think the point you make about access to the, to the judicial system for people irrespective of means um, is, is very pertinent and in fact you remind me of a uh, observation that I, I used to make around the ultimate effect of technology is to bring to the masses uh, privileges and, and facilities that were previously only in the preserve of the very wealthy. Well, look what happens now. I mean, people can get access on YouTube to the greatest singers in the world and they can have people uh, reading and playing the greatest Shakespeare dramas. They can find documentaries on everything they can get to, through Wikipedia and other sources, huge amounts of information that was not known. They're, they've become a supplement to the human brain. And the puzzling question is whether we are headed for some sort of implant that <laughs> makes having a little machine with all this capacity look very old fashioned because you can simply roll your eyes or shake your head and there it will be in your head, and uh, mm. it is a supplement to the brain. Well, this and is to the consistent. That's right. This is the concept of the singular singularity, the merging of man and machine, as it were, that we become superhuman, effectively. And a, an observation that I've made before, and I think others agree, is that the effect of technology, whether it be a pair of pliers, or a microscope, or an amplifier, uh, hearing aid, or anything, is to really uh, elevate human capability. Yes, but the, the real question is not elevating, but moving far beyond and then in effect changing the essential character of the human being who is uh, supplemented by these right. capacities. And uh, uh, I, I ask forgiveness for constantly talking about the law because that was my vocation. I know it and I've thought of all the issues, but uh, every occupation, every job, every human existence is profoundly affected by uh, the changes that are happening. And that's why it's a great thing that the profession comes together, not just to think about ways that the technology can be made to work better, mm -hmm. but to think about where the technology is taking us, the human species, into the future into a dangerous world of nuclear weapons, a dangerous world of climate change, dangerous world of big migrations of people, shortage of water, all of these problems. But amongst all of these is this amazing technology which can be a great boon to humankind so long as we remain in charge of it. I think that's a very great place to end. But I want to thank you, Michael Kirby, for your own um, thinking in this area and, and the advocacy that you continue to perform on behalf, I suppose, of Australia as you, as you travel overseas and, and your vast experience uh, as, a, as, a, as I think Australia's longest serving judicial officer. Uh, certainly that was the point where you were at in 19, uh, 2008. 
Um, and, well, thank uh, you, Peter, and, and we will continue this conversation in about 20 or 25 years' time. <laughs>